Qin pure, purity. Pure, pure. Qin means pure. Let's welcome these not very welcome invaders from the north of China, called Manchu people or Banner people, the Qi. They took the place of the Ming Dynasty in 1644. It was not a peaceful transition. The Manchus were nomadic people and quite the aggressive ones. So when they placed themselves on the imperial throne in Beijing, a lot of the Hans, the ethnic group that was the majority in the land, were not very happy. The new government decided to show them who was the boss now and enforced some laws that everybody had to wear Manchu clothes. But why am I interested in all of this? I have to admit that my curiosity was awoken watching a TV series, The Story of Yanshi Palace. If you see my other video, you know how it happened. The Story of Yanshi Palace is my absolute favorite. And I got really caught in studying the costume of the time. It's such an interesting period of history. The story takes place during the Qianlong Emperor reign. And we follow Wei Yinglu, a professional embroiderer, who enters the palace to discover what happened to her sister. At this point, the hate towards the new rulers was a bit less intense than at the beginning of their reign. And also, in the imperial city where the story takes place, most of the people wear Manchus anyway. But to clarify what you should wear not to offend anybody and to get the promotion you wanted, our new friend, the Qianlong Emperor, commissioned a very intense manuscript, the illustrated regulation of ceremonial paraphernalia of the present dynasty. Who doesn't need that? Apparently, our emperor was a bit of a fashion nerd, and he put a lot of effort and time in regulating the ritual codes and procedures. And I think they did such an amazing job in recreating all these wonderful clothes in the story of Yanshi Palace. Thank you, Wan Shang, for all the hints. Now, let's start and have a look at the fashion of this time. When we talk about Qing fashion, we have to consider three main aspects. As we said before, Manchu people were of nomadic origins and they really cared to maintain their traditions. Of course, that was most evident at the imperial court. One point the new rulers made at the beginning of their reign was to impose to men the queue. That means shaving your forehead and keep the hair long only at the back. You have to know that for Han people, hair were sacred as every other part of the body because they were a gift of their parents. So you never cut them. Remember Mulan cutting her hair before going to war? That was wrong. It would never have happened. Nobody would have screamed. Ah, she has long hair. She's a woman. No. Anyway, the new government was quite adamant that every man should wear the queue. And that brought a lot of violent rebellions. As we see in this show, the new rulers had it their own way. The Manchu tradition and influence, though, was not only in how they kept their hair, but also in a lot of their clothes. We already said that Manchu people, or the Qi, Banner people, were originally from the north and a nomadic group. That meant that they lived their best life on horses, going where the heart or needs brought them. That is why, I guess, they are so fixated with horse hooves. We see a lot of their clothing described this way. We have horse hoof sleeves, and horse hoof shoes, the most popular. But not only in horse hooves inspired clothing, we see that the Manchu inheritance was key. In the show, we can see that a lot of pressure was put on the ladies to maintain their ancestors' lifestyle, which was quite frugal. So they had to be careful not to be corrupted by the lavish Han or Ming tradition, but to remember and keep the hard style of the past. Yeah. Right, as if that was achievable sitting around all day and having money to spend. <laughs> Another interesting aspect, though, that also was connected to their nomadic origins is that Manchu ladies didn't bind their feet. The government actually forbid this practice at the beginning of their reign at the same time as they imposed the queue. But I suppose because to conform women was not as important as with men, this practice remained quite widespread till the beginning of the 20th century. I'm sure you have already heard of this very painful and crippling fashion, where young girls had to bind their feet so that they remained small and beautiful. The pain was so severe that women couldn't walk very far and they were invalid for life. 
That, of course, didn't matter very much because women were confined to their homes. So, you know, nobody really cared. But Manchu ladies, probably again because of their nomadic and very practical origins, didn't bind their feet. As it always happens, though, the rigidity of the Manchu rulers didn't last very long. And some interesting and different trends crept into the court fashion. One of the aspects that the Manchu decided to keep from the previous dynasty was the theory of yin and yang and the five elements, which meant that every color had a meaning. If we look in the past, for example, there is the Chu dynasty, which shows as their main color red fire. And when they were overthrown by the Qin dynasty, the latter chose water. Talking about marketing, with the same entrepreneurish fervor, the Qin dynasty chose as their color black and blue, which was the main tone worn by high-ranking officials and noblemen. For the emperor, the chosen color was yellow, which meant earth. And also, you know, it's a color that it's quite useful to stand out in a crowd. He was the only one that could wear it. And when I say only, I mean only. We can see different tones worn by consorts or the heir apparent, which apparently wore a apricot yellow, or the other princes, which had a more golden orange yellow. Bright yellow that was only for the boss. You got the wrong tone, you were out. You think that was it. But no, when you chose, let's say, a color for a less formal gown, you had also to consider the season, because for every season there was the right color. You know, your wardrobe could put you in a lot of troubles. Last but not least, we have to look at embroidery. As we said, Wei Yinglu enters the palace as a professional embroiderer. It was work usually done by the woman of the house, and we can see that in the show the concubines, or also the maids, embroider little tokens, signs of affection for each other or for the emperor himself. But of course that wasn't enough. So there was a platoon of professionals that made everything that was needed in the palaces, because they embroidered everything. And also, surprise, surprise, embroidery was strictly regulated. <gasps> I think you're starting to get that you couldn't really mess up because everything was already carefully chosen. They didn't like freestyling, especially at formal occasions. The famous Long Pao, the dragon robe, had, of course, dragons embroidered over it. And they had to have five clothes, which was meant for the emperor and his family. If the clothes were only four, then it was called a Mang Pao, and that was worn by lower-ranking officials and noblemen. I can imagine it would have been a delight for me being astigmatic counting how many clothes there were on the gown of the person in front of me to understand his rank. So much fun. Luckily for me, though, there were also other 12 symbols that could be chosen for their gowns. Another very famous indication of rank was the mandarin square, worn by officials. Looking at the animals stitched on it, birds was for civil roles, beasts were for military ones, you could also understand the rank of the wearer. Not spoiling anything, but one of the characters towards the end were some mandarin square with a red crowned crane, the highest of ranks. As a bonus in the show, we also discover another technique of embroidering that uses feathers or animal fur. The very precious peacock thread and deer tail hair are used as a plot device to show to us how clever Wei Ying Lu is. Are they real techniques? Yes. They are inspired by real craftsmanship of the past. Amazing. Now, knowing these three aspects, we can move on and look at the cuts of the dresses, which were not very difficult and not very diverse, but each had a very specific role to fulfill. That is though for the second part of this video. I hope you enjoyed it so far. And if you did, please click like and subscribe to my new channel. Thank you very much.